Truth Seeker and or its affiliates are not responsible for any strange phenomena that may occur during or after listening to this podcast, which may include the following. Heightened senses of awareness, psychic abilities, UFO sightings, alien contact, time loss, out-of-body experiences, ringing in the ears, ESP, lucid dreaming, increased synchronicities, astral projection, telepathy, stronger intuition, levitation, miraculous healings, and or remote viewing. Please be advised to listen at your own discretion. She's not a Christian! Give it up, y'all. Your portal to the paranormal, esoteric, and all things spiritual. She's tampering in dark sided stuff! And now, your host, Truth Seeker. Yo, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm True Seeker. This is the True Seeker Podcast. Excited, delighted to be with you guys today on this beautiful Saturday. So uh, we don't really do a lot of podcasting on Saturdays, but uh, this is what we had to do to make it work with my guest today, and I wanted to make this happen. been trying to make this happen for a while, so we're going to jump into conversation here in a few minutes. I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's supporting the podcast. Uh, we are a listener-funded show, so uh, you guys are the enablers. So thank you uh, again as always, from the bottom of my heart, everybody who's supporting the vision, the music, uh, the podcast, everything that I'm bringing to the table via Patreon, um, couldn't do it without your help. So uh, shout out to all of you guys who are doing that. Um, bunch of new stuff that I'm uh, releasing on Patreon. I just did a, a Patreon exclusive album. Uh, me, Loke Saint, and Colt Truth put out a group album called The Messengers, and it's nine tracks, and that's patreon exclusive the only way you can get access to that is if you're a patron so for any level of giving you get access to my entire discography of music thursday night school of the mystics uh we're starting a new tier now uh for uh 12 dollars a week you get access to our sunday seer class and this is something that we're doing uh we're going to be starting tomorrow and it's going to be every sunday 8 a.m central uh the early bird gets the worm so we'll be doing some holotropic breathing uh breath work Um, guided meditations and all that kind of stuff early on Sunday morning. So if you want to get access to that, the information is at patreon.com backslash true seeker. So I appreciate all the support and I'm going to keep, uh, filling that stuff up with, uh, uh, content. So that's what it's about. So my guest today, uh, Mark Jennings, formerly of the band 38th parallel. Mark, how are you? I'm well, how are you, Derek? Good, man. Uh, Good, good. Finally, to have you on. We've been trying to make this happen for a while, and uh, you know, I'm saying conflicting of, of 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 schedules and stuff like that. But uh, finally, able to make it happen. So, welcome to the show, man. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be a part of it. For sure, man. Um, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna show you a couple things right quick. I know I sent you this image the other day, but I have the ticket from when I first uh, seen uh, 38th Parallel. This is uh, when you guys okay. opened for Skillet. And the Benjamin Gate, and Benjamin yeah. Gate wasn't at this show. I was disappointed. I wanted to see them. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Lo- you know what I'm saying? Love their music. But this is a Friday, March 1st, 2002, uh, Lloyd Presbyterian Church in LaGrange, Georgia. So for those of you who are watching, I st- we still have that ticket, right? 
So that's a cool keepsake. 2002, man, time flies. I got a couple photos here as well. I'm going to show uh, these photos for those of you who are watching on the podcast. Those of you who are listening, if you want to see these pictures, I'll put them in the show notes and you can go to the website and see them. But check this out. I'm going to show you a couple of these. <laughs> Do you remember, son? Let's see. Yeah. I got a couple more. Yeah, okay. barely. Barely. Oh, no. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Is yeah. Young man. <laughs> He's very young man. Look, that's me and you. Oh my goodness, that's you, huh? Yeah, look nothing like <laughs> no, oh boy. not a uh, speck of hair on my face at all. I couldn't grow a beard. <laughs> yeah, well, me neither. If so, yeah. <laughs> two thousand and two. We're in the same boat. There you are again. We got a bunch of these pictures, man. We still have them. Like all the, I mean, mm. that's what we did traveling. We actually drove. Um, four hours to see you guys, and we were we were diehard Skillet fans. But I think I I even told you told you at the show like we we came to see you guys. So I was on yeah, like all the uh, Christian rock websites, and they would have all the comparison charts. Like if you are into Christian music and you like Marilyn Manson, then check out this band. If you like Cold Chamber, check out this band. If you like Limp Biscuit or whatever. And I, I found y'all's early demos, man, like the three times denied, like the early demo stuff. And I like fell in love. And so, uh, I was, we, we drove off of the demo stuff, man, he, hearing you guys, that's what we did. And so, uh, dro drove four hours and, uh, the album wasn't even out yet at the time, I don't believe. And so it was just, no, they come out to April. Yeah, so that was that was cool, man. So just some nostalgia. It was kind of funny too. Just the other day, I had uh, um, Nate and Brandon on from These Five Down. I don't know if you uh, have crossed paths with those guys back in the day, but it was as far as like the early Christian metal scene and stuff. Yeah, I remember the name These Five Down. I don't know if we cross paths with them very often, but I, it rings a bell. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the band, man, just for people who, uh, you know, that album still holds up though, dude, you know what I'm saying? Turn the Thank tides. You. Like that album was phenomenal at the time and still holds up, but just, just talk a little bit about it for people who don't know, you know, what we're talking about at all, man. Just kind of, kind of give some background on 38th parallel. Yeah. Well, 38th parallel, um, started really when we were in high school, uh, the, the bass player, Jeff, he had this dream of being in a rock band and we all had backgrounds in, and musical theater and, and drama and music. And my hope had been to do Broadway, that kind of thing. Uh, Jeff wanted to do the rock band thing and I said, okay, whatever. Um, so that's one aspect of it. I was just this musical background and we got together and started a band and, and it was, you know, I had a good friend who was in a local band at the time who, who once said, you know, if any band knew how bad they were when they first started, there wouldn't be any bands. Uh, and I think he's quite right. We were a nightmare. Um, had a different name. We were called Octorock. And uh, decided that that was a really silly name. And so we had two other guitar players at the time, and, and we were trying to come up with a better name. And there were three options on the table. They were 38th parallel, uh, which we'd found in a history book. And Jeff thought that that had a kind of nice ring to it. And I could see a kind of, I was a stickler for having everything has to have a meaning of some kind. So yeah. I, I saw in there this kind of demilitarized zone, uh, no man's land uh, between two warring fractions. And I thought, well, gosh, if we're talking about um, a Christian worldview in a world that's hostile to that, are we not the one standing in the no man's land? That kind of a thing. Um, the other two options were uh, straw hat, Matt and the barnyard dance. <laughs> and Harvester Harry and the Visions of Wushka. Those two options were voted down, and we went with 38th Parallel, and those two guitar players never, never, they, they left long before we ever got signed, uh, and Shane came in and, and moved on from there. But uh, So, yeah, that was kind of the, the nascent aspect of the band. Uh, started playing a lot locally, met some people. That demo that you mentioned, that was um, uh, the, the work of Sean McMahon. Um, we had all moved into a uh, duplex together and we're not going to college just out of high school decided we really wanted to do this band thing. And so we connected up with Sean um, who was from Des Moines and Des Moines is famous for um, Slipknot and Sean had done Slipknot's demos. Uh, and even I think their track um, spit it out on their, on their first record is wow. still the track that Sean had done. That's awesome. Yeah, he, he was the best song ever. <laughs> yeah, it's a great song. He's a yeah. great producer. So we connected with Sean and, and did this demo and started shopping it around. And it was a very long, cold winter living in that duplex, just playing shows, um, 
hoping to hear something. And then in the spring, people just came biting. We had a couple of different let record labels respond to us, but Word Records uh, was the one that really piqued our interest. And they had just created a rock division um, when they acquired Squint Entertainment. And so we went with them and signed with them in, in um, uh, late October of 2001. And, you know, had uh, this kind of labor of love over the past several years to make all of those songs for that out that I did this thing, you know, a hundred years ago, they'll listen to some of that music and, and tell me that they're impressed with it and moved by it. And that's really great to, to know that it's had an impact and I'm, I'm glad that it, uh, it went the way it did. So that's kind of a quick cliff notes version of the history of 38th parallel. Yeah, man, there was, um, there's like a lot of, um, sophomore releases right the second albums that come out and i was talking to these five down and they were kind of in a similar boat where they put out their first album and then the second one the second album actually came out after the band broke up you know the band's done but they still had all the material somebody at the label put the album out people had already pre-ordered and all that kind of stuff they went ahead and put it out years after it was supposed to come out which was kind of weird but um i got a hold of some demo stuff and i don't know if it was a a official album release from you guys for the uh the uh, follow-up album what what was the deal with that with with the i mean the sound was different and we could talk about that a little bit but was that an official release or i know there was a handful of tracks that, that that were out there on the internet no, that that was not an official release. It was very unpolished. It was all pretty much just one shot. Here you go. Those were sloppy demos that we just kind of cobbled together in the midst of being on tour um, for the record label because they wanted to do a second record. Um, but they kept us kind of in the dark about that, what was going on, the inner workings of the label. And what had happened, I discovered several months later, after all, we put all these demos together, is they had dissolved the rock division. Um, and I was you know, starting to feel like perhaps we'd run our course, we'd done our thing, you know, I, it definitely had felt like a calling, but it was a calling for a season. Yeah. And it felt like that season might be ending and it was time to move on to just some other things in life. Right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, th- those were not at all meant to be, um, official releases. They were just kind of for fun. I think somebody even um, tried to make a cover for it or something and put like download links out there and stuff. Oh, really? Yeah, on different right. Christian rock websites and stuff like that, yeah. Huh, that's funny. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, that's great. I'm glad. that It, it was really just because I, I, we knew that there were some people out there who might want to hear something more, and it didn't really matter to us if we got paid for it or not. It was just like, well, this this is all we have. <laughs> yeah. and it's not great. I really, there are a lot of those songs I don't like very much, but there are a lot on there that I, I feel pretty strongly were, would have been solid songs. I would have liked to have had the chance to, properly record them and so on but it is what it is um as far as you say kind of coming out kind of running its course and so i talked to i've had andrew schwab on here from project 86 like i said these five down really being into old school christian metal christian rap core if that was the genre at, at the time and then like uh it started dying out and i i was fans of you know what i'm saying you, you, your your music and a lot of those other bands that you know what i'm saying rod laver there was a bunch of them at the time the christian music man they kind of as far as the 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 uh, rap metal pod kind of fronting that stuff a lot of them had to change their style gotta talk about the uh you know the christian hardcore scene blowing up and so the music got a lot heavier so here uh even all the festivals cornerstone all these big festivals you have all these christian metal bands were pretty much doing screamo and it had to have breakdowns and that kind of stuff and that that stuff came uh you know what I'm saying really fast and so i think it pushed a lot of the rap rock stuff on the back burner and you guys i feel like were kind of caught in the midst of that transition do you, was that a thing did you notice okay everything's getting a lot heavier here we are singing beautiful melodies and rapping and the kids are changing the style is is changing it's kind of morphing would you guys caught up in that did you see it from within happening yeah i did we, I definitely would say I saw that happening, um, that it was going heavier, it was getting edgier. Um, and I think that's great. I, I like that. Uh, I don't know. Huh. I, I don't, we didn't really make a conscious decision to make the music be one thing or another. It just kind of happened. You know, it, it was what it was. And we definitely would not have gone the route of, of the more screamy stuff. Not that there's, I love that stuff, but yeah. it's just not something we would have been doing. Um, and it, it's funny it's very perceptive uh, on your part to recognize that massive shift um yeah but it wasn't 
I don't know that that really was a contributing factor. Well, uh, uh, and and I'm I'm asking as well because you know I'm saying the demos that came out there wasn't a lot of rapping on the demos I, I, I found it, it seemed like there was a lot of uh, you know what I'm saying singing on there. Yeah, and that was um, maybe a little bit more deliberate. Uh, we were starting to lean away from the the rappy stuff. It seemed like a nice tool to have in the toolkit, but it was it was very clear that that the sort of hip hop um, yeah driven rap rock thing was on its way out and then biscuit they, ran it through the ground right <laughs> yeah exactly they they murdered it hard um it was just i don't know it, it's just it was just time you know just to move away from that kind of thing and we didn't that's not the music we wanted to make anymore mm -hmm. so we just didn't make it that way talk a little bit about the dynamic of of being a front man because you shared that that spotlight it was like a duo front man thing right and there was a couple bands out at the time that kind of kind of did that um obviously lincoln park and everyone would call you guys like the christian equivalent to lincoln park which at the time was one of the biggest bands in the world it wasn't a bad you know what i'm saying uh comparison and still isn't really but just talk about you know what i'm saying the duo front man thing that that you guys did yeah yeah i and I, I have to i have to address the lincoln park thing um because it it, it came up all the time yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, and it it was so funny we had two frontmen before we ever heard of lincoln park um and i remember the first time i saw lincoln park i thought oh no because i, I know i knew <laughs> right away that people were going to say that we were trying to rip off lincoln park which was not the case and they were doing the same thing a melody oriented rap rock and i was like oh great but that being said, um, no, Lincoln Park was not an influence. I admired the heck out of Lincoln Park. I thought they were incredible, and and kudos to them and their and their the success that they had, and that they still make some music. I think they were amazing. Um, as far as the dynamic of having the two front men, um, I, I never thought of myself as a front man singular. I thought of myself as a part of an ensemble. Um, again, as I mentioned, we had this background in musical theater and drama and every actor in the show is a part of conveying the story. And to me, our music was a story and, and these songs were, um, they, there was a character, uh, being reflected in the song, being embodied by the song. And, and we were each different aspects of that character to me. So I was just doing my part and everyone else was doing theirs as well. So I, I guess I might have been the face of it in terms of movement and that kind of thing. But um, so was Nate. And, and I never felt like it was much of a competition or anything like that. We were, it, it, it was like a duet almost. Mm -hmm. And that, did you guys write together a lot? Was that, was you guys playing off of each other or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Usually how the writing process would work is the instrumentalists would come up with the sort of meat of the song in terms of the progression and the, and the, um, their individual parts, the bass, the guitar, the drums. Um, and then I by and large was responsible for the lyrics. Uh, and then Nate and I would usually collaborate on, on melodies. We would all kind of collaborate on the melodies, but it was largely, uh, Nate and I who, who put the melodies together for the songs. Um, what, what happened towards the end as far as like the band breaking up and stuff? And I, I remember, you know, seeing some, some footage on maybe MySpace or old YouTube stuff or whatever. And there was just like different members showing up. And I think, I think Nate was gone at the time and it was like you and then a couple other people doing some of the 38th parallel stuff, maybe at a little small concert or festival or whatever. So it, it was, it was very different. It was almost, it almost seemed like just by watching the video, you were trying to, keep it together you were trying to keep 30 days parallel going but it was just kind of you know what I'm saying fading out was that kind of what happened yeah that was a kind of um the band had already broken up by the time that i know what video you're talking about or the band had already been over but we were kind of sort of doing some shows off and on just for kicks just to get back together we had a, a brief period where we had seriously planned on rejuvenating it and doing it again and then that just kind of Nah, just decided that, that wasn't going to be good just because we were all moving on in life. We were getting, you know, guys were getting married and getting college degrees and jobs out of state. And I was pursuing different things as well. And as much as I would have loved that, it felt like you can't hang on to a ghost. You have to let it go. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but that, yeah. that in particular was just kind of. Yeah. Just, yeah, just a couple last shows trying to trying to hold it together. But it was just kind of obvious that everybody was doing different different stuff. Right. Yeah, because the band had ended. Um, 
as I say, what had happened is we had found out they dissolved the rock division and, and I made the decision um, for myself to say, I can't tell the rest of these guys what to do, but I, I need to let this go. I'm done with it and just move on with my life. And um, uh, that's what everyone tended to do. And then we thought, well, maybe there's something still here. Let's try it. And then we just kind of recognized in the process, like, oh, goodness, we're all <laughs> old and moving on. It's not uh, time to do this anymore. Yeah. So, so how, I mean, how did you guys get on with Skillet, like on, on that tour or whatever? And how, I mean, how, how um, what, what kind of experiences did you have on that tour as well? Great ones. That, that was, a, that was our first big tour. Uh, we'd never done anything like that before. And it was an honor to tour with Skillet. And it's been gratifying to see how well they've continued to do yeah. uh, throughout the years. It's amazing. They are, I got to say, they are some of the most genuine, warm hearted people I had ever met. Yeah. Um, John and Corey are just remarkable. Uh, at the time, they had uh, this guy named Ben Cassica playing guitar, and um, I can't remember her last name, but Lori was the drummer, and we got we all got along very very well. Uh, they loved to gag our set and do silly things, and we got along with uh, our drummer was incredibly friendly, Aaron Nordyke, and he and Ben Cassica were just like set attached at the hip most of that tour. I had I was trying out, I was in my my very young days of learning about health and fitness and exercise, and I had one of those stupid belts that's supposed to stimulate your abs to fire or whatever so Casca was <laughs> yeah yeah he put that thing on was hanging out in her hotel room going is it doing anything man is it doing anything and i was like it's gotta be i don't know <laughs> so it was just um it was stuff like that but it was it was a lot of fun the benjamin gate people were a, a blast they were a riot we got along with them really really well and of course everyone was infatuated with adrian uh in fact nate was having he, we were at, uh, especially jeremy at, camp uh, right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah dang it jeremy um we were at uh, a hotel and nate was talking to adrian as they were walking toward the swimming pool but he wasn't looking at the pool he was looking at her while he was talking and he just kept walking and just foot after foot walked directly into the swimming pool into the deep end and down he goes and she died laughing that's a probably one of my greatest memories from that that tour that was a lot of fun that's awesome man great memories dude um so as far as you guys being uh, a Christian rock band when you started, like, uh, what, what what's your testimony, man? Like, what what was the uh, you know what I'm saying you come into faith or whatever? Like, did you have a, like like a, a strong encounter with, with Christ? Uh, were you you know did, was you a Christian as a little a kid and just kind of seemed like the thing to do, or did you have like some big story? Well, you know, it's a little bit of both. Uh, I was raised uh, in the American Midwest, which is very predominantly evangelical Christian. Um, I was raised in a, in a Christian home and in an evangelical church and the, the concept of accepting Christ or whatever language gets used by that denomination was very much so on my lips and on my mind. Um, and it was a kind of just the way things were. It seemed to me that that's just the truth and, and that's my life. And there you have it. Um, it became serious to me throughout the course of doing the thing, the hard business of living uh, as, a, as a teenager. I had um, my, my parents were very good about being reflections of, um, <clears throat> I guess you could say the social, social justice aspect of the gospel, wherein, you know, there was a guy who my mom had grown up with who had contracted AIDS and was dying of AIDS and, and he was gay. And this was shocking and terrible to a lot of people uh, in a Midwestern evangelical setting. But we took him into our house and hung out with him. And, and I saw what the grace of God looks like on a person's life as they go through the process of having AIDS to their death. That was a part of my youth. Um, watching people die of cancer and all just the, the stuff that happens in life, the ugliness of, of a world gone wrong that just, ate at me and ate at me until the point where I was just in despair trying to reconcile how, how do you deal with this, this evil in the world and, and call yourselves, you know, think that something like Christian theism is true. And it just so happened that when I was 17, just around the time the band started, uh, I met these, these people from Davenport, Iowa through a mutual friend named Kayla Kaufman, um, who was a remarkable young woman. Uh, and these kids, Love. They didn't know me from Adam, and they were just loving me like I was their brother. Like they'd known me all their lives, and their idea of a good time was to go to Central Campus at Iowa State University and sing hymns. So I drove them out there to do that, and it was um, one of those kind of ineffable spiritual experiences where just I thought, how do you deal with 
pain and suffering and ugliness in the world. And it occurred to me that it's in this kind of cross-shaped self-giving love that these kids are, are reflecting. And that seized me at the center of my being and has ever since that, that, that is the gospel. That is the good news that it's released to the captives. It's that God has become King in and through Jesus. And that means evil is defeated period full stop. And so that's become just the thing I try to figure out how to express, be it in a rock band or be it just by loving my wife. Well, it's, that's, that's kind of, mm-hmm. that's my testimony, man. That's where it's at. <laughs> stuff, man. All right. So, so where do we go from, um, the, the, uh, you know, is it ministry oriented 38th parallel Christian rock band to, uh, some years later, haven't heard, heard, heard from you, uh, uh my, my brother-in-law hits me up and says, hey, the guy from 38th Parallel is in, uh, or at least, you know what I'm saying, some of the members are in a Harry Potter band called the Ministry of Magic. Where do we go from 38th Parallel to the Ministry of Magic, and what is that about? Yeah, well, huh. Ministry of Magic was um, really just an excuse to get together and make music and have some fun and party. It is really all that that was. Um it, it happened at a time in life where um, some of us were, I don't want to say having abandoned the faith, but in questioning or darker periods or just working through some life stuff. And that's not to say that Ministry of Magic was all debauchery and silliness. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying it, it we were around it a lot. So I can understand why people would want to say these guys have gone off the deep end. That wasn't it at all. But um, surely I'm not going to deny that those opportunities were around, right? But it was really just um, an excuse to have some fun with with your old friends and make some music again. And it was never intended to be um, as big as it got. I I was blown away when I joined it just for fun to go do do some trips and sing again just every other weekend or whatever. And all of a sudden we're putting out music on iTunes and we've beaten Owl City uh, for sales. And I'm trying to figure that out. (laughs) This is just silliness. It's just a good time. But... It was uh, it was a wonderful time to kind of remember who I was, uh, get refocused. And it also afforded me the opportunity to how I met my wife. We were doing a show in Boston and she was there and, you know, pretty girl, hang out with her, start talking with her. And next thing I know, I'm commuting back and forth to uh, to Toronto, Ontario from Ames, Iowa, uh, listening to lectures in my car and finding myself drawn back into my faith. And then and then from there, it's kind of the second phase of Mark Jennings history. It's, it's back to the faith and get married and have a house. So you're not doing the ministry of magic anymore. No, no, that, that, um, some that of those videos out. have like millions of views on YouTube, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's something I was honored to be a part of. I was honored to make music with those guys. We had a, a lot of fun, a lot of fun doing that. And I'm pretty proud of some of the stuff that we did. Uh, musically and 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 just great memories with all that um what had happened with that is a lot of the wizard rock bands um as they were called wizard rock bands uh would not be very well behaved with younger ladies not us but a lot of the other ones and of course accusations start to fly and impressions start to fly and one of our members started getting accused of certain things that were not anything illegal, but he basically got accused of being the functional equivalent of a bad frat boy. Um, and that therefore kind of blacklisted us and, and that's okay. It was kind of the end of it. Anyway, I was married and living in Toronto and I wasn't going to do a whole lot more shows. My brother was married. Aaron was getting married. You know, it, it was what it was. It's a shame that it went down the way that it did. I feel like it was a very one-sided conversation but that's not to say that i am denying the things that these people accuse them of necessarily i don't know i wasn't there but i think there was almost an an attitude of witch hunt at the time and sadly it went the way that it did Mm. um was there um so you know i'm saying you being a christian being in 30th parallel whatever was there was there a point that you stayed away from the harry potter stuff because i know even back then there was like it was big so the the in the churches, they would preach against it. Like they would do 
all types of like smear campaigns and if you like they're doing real witchcraft in in harry potter and kids are putting spells on their teacher and there's all this this weird stuff that wasn't true but the churches would take that stuff and run with it and stuff and they'd have evangelists come and don't let your kids watch harry potter and stuff and so for a christian we knew pokemon and harry potter was off limits like those were the two things you couldn't do and um so that so that I didn't want to watch it at all, and I especially come from like the background of the occult and like really dark witchcraft and stuff. So I didn't want to entertain nothing like that. And then hearing the sermons, and I'm like, yeah, witchcraft is nothing to play with, you know, this kind of stuff. So for you to uh, to be a Christian and then get into some of the the uh, the um, you know, what I'm saying Ministry of Magic stuff, or or even just watch Harry Potter, was there a disconnect? Was there something like I'm touching the forbidden fruit, or I'm not supposed to watch this? This you know, what I'm saying the first time of, of of even watching it because it was for me like when i finally watched it with my family years later like i know so like, oh god okay be careful let's see what this is you know what i'm saying and it was beautiful it was really good my 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 i have harry potter stuff all in the room right now my wife and and, and daughter are like diehard harry potter fans now because i introduced them to it my wife has tattoos and all kinds of stuff and uh, literally all types of Harry Potter, Harry Potter themed birthday parties and stuff. And then here's me, a Christian minister as well, whose family is loves Harry Potter now. Right. So there was this weird disconnecting and really still is, you know, you know what I'm saying for a, a big part of that. But was that there for you? Like just getting into it, watching it for the first time or something? No, uh, not really. <laughs> I was, I was in my twenties when the things were coming out and, I thought it very strange that the church was reacting to it the way that it was, because I didn't find anything any more objectionable about it than, say, the Lord of the Rings, which was being applauded by the church, or the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And yeah. I suppose one would say, well, yes, but those have overtly Christian themes. Well, what do you call the power of love overcoming death itself. That's the central theme yeah. of the Harry Potter oh, yeah. story. That's the power that lives in Harry's skin. Right. So uh, I guess, I, no, that never crossed my mind. Uh, anything negative or dark associated with Harry Potter for me had to do with the ugliness that comes out of people when they're in crazy situations uh, and it, nothing to do with the story itself. And those are things we have to own ourselves and move beyond and, and make amends for, but there's no, that, that whole aspect, the witchcraft thing, I, I got to say, man, I, I think too much gets – that stuff is important. It is serious. Don't misunderstand me. But I think to get so lost in that is an example of to, – to miss the forest through the trees. Real evil happens when people devalue each other. So you might be thinking that you are being pious – and upholding the laws of the church yeah. of God by saying these Harry Potter fans are evil and it's an evil story. And this is terrible. And these are bad people. Well, now you have devalued a human being because they don't agree with your theology. This does not strike me as anything looking like the kingdom that Jesus was preaching. So uh, yeah, I guess I'm taking this as an opportunity to really decry that kind of thing from the church because I thought it was not only silliness, I thought it was dangerous, an example of just hurting people instead of loving them and valuing them, which everybody's supposed to be doing. Yeah. And you kind of you kind of did that, though, right? As far as get, like hanging out with Harry Potter fans and just, you know, what I'm saying just, you know, if you're a Christian, you're going to share the love of Christ no matter what stage you are. I know you you say you, you, you might might have been going through a phase or whatever, but you still I'm sure you're. You, you know, you still love people, man, which is the heart of the gospel, too. And so where the church would like shun Harry Potter and all that kind of stuff, you were there in the midst of all of them being able to maybe, I don't know, be Jesus to them in a sense. Right. And so that's that's really, I think, what the gospel is about. And like you're saying, like the church pushing those people away or this is God and that's God or this isn't God or who gets to hear the good news of the gospel. Only those who come to church or whatever the case is. Right. But you're actually in there with the people. Yeah, man, I, that, that's exactly it. And it was, um, yeah, as I say, I was going through a bit of a phase, which was a little bit more later. I mean, for most of the time that I was in, in the Harry Potter band, I was still very vocal about my faith and was trying to be uh, representative of that without being preachy. And, and so, yeah, it's exactly what the aim was, was just to love people as people, um, not as, you know, 
things I could put on my scorecard for who did I witness to and get to make a conversion statement or something. Yeah. It was like, no, I just love them, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that, is that, is that kind of what your faith kind of, uh, you know what I'm saying, transformed into more of a, something that's more practical versus evangelical? Like I have to proselytize, like I just have to be Jesus now to these people and love the unlovable and those who have never, you know what I'm saying, experienced grace, show them grace and mercy. So is it something more practical now versus I have to have, be on a stage with a microphone preaching? Because anybody can do that. Like that was really easy for me to, when, when I'm up there with a microphone. But as far as doing one-on-one -on -one evangelism with people and sharing my heart, that was a little bit harder, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it exactly. Um, I, I would say my my – my faith has evolved um, by and large due to becoming very interested in the academic aspects of it. That's changed the way I think about things theologically. Um, for sure. I'm, I'm very much impressed by the work of scholars like N.T. Wright, um, Scott McKnight, uh, John Walton. Uh, these are some, some names in scholarship guys that have very much so shaped the way I think theologically. And what I discover is when we have a term like evangelical, it, it means to be an announcer of the good news. Um, and I certainly think that it's hard to announce something if you don't say anything. So clearly there is that aspect of it. Um, but it's an announcement in the fullness of your being. It, it's yeah. how you conduct yourself in life. It, ha it is how you love. I mean, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. Well, that's not saying go be poor and meek. That's saying I've got good news for you. That's what the Evangelion, where we get terms like evangelism, it just means good news. That's what the good news is. It's that the whole world has changed because God has become king through Jesus. And that means everything that's made you poor, those powers, the darkness, it's defeated. Well, how does that look? Well, that translates into the people of God doing the work of God by the power of his spirit. And that's soup kitchens, practically speaking. That's going out to the homeless and giving them a blanket. That's um, one aspect of it. The other is also very simple things. That's how you love your wife. That's how you take care of your dog. Yeah. All of those things. Yep. That's good, man. Yeah. Um, so following you on Facebook, starting to see some some uh, workout pictures. And I guess you've <laughs> been into health for a while. Um, but we're starting to see some gains, some gains there. So I guess you're taking that a little bit more serious or, or have have you been into that for a while? Because you said you, you mentioned even around the 38th parallel, maybe even studying some of that stuff. But uh, so what's the uh, what, what, what's the deal with the with the uh, weight training and and that kind of stuff? What are you doing with that? Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny. I, I, I really wrestled with it, particularly in the 30th parallel days, just kind of um, body image issues as people do. I didn't like the way I looked. And so I got really thin in the 38th parallel days thinking that that'll make me feel better about myself because of how I look. Um, and I got too thin. I was down to like 130 pounds at one point. And that occurred to me that that's a great way to wind up dead. So started just taking it more seriously and trying to get a, um, a healthier mindset about it. And that led to um, the love of heavy weights and, and, steak <laughs> uh, which some might object to say that's not healthy that's well there's a debate to be had there but all that aside um i i found that i really enjoyed weight training i liked how it made me feel i liked how it made me look um and then i kind of got past really it's funny when you mentioned the gains thing i've noticed this really in the last year or so i i don't really care anymore i've kind of grew out of caring what what i look like too much um, I'm more interested in what's going on in the inside and, and, and just being healthy. And I've discovered that I started to look better when I stopped really caring about it and started looking bigger when I stopped trying to chase being bigger and just really got a kick out of lifting heavy. To be, this is such a hilarious thing to talk about because this is just my, I don't know if it's my vanity or just my hobby. Maybe it's a little bit of both, but I just like throwing around heavy weight. It feels good. I like going to work and the guys can't lift the press, but I can. So I, well, I don't like it that much because now I got to go do all the jobs that require the heavy lifting. <laughs> But, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, that's kind of all it is. It's, it's a little bit of uh, vanity. Hey, look what I've accomplished, but also a little bit of just, it's just fun. Just enjoy it. Like yeah. you... What do you do for a living? I am a belting technician. Okay. So, <laughs> so what that means is I fabricate and install conveyor belts in, uh, anywhere from a bakery to a recycling plant. Um, little tiny lightweight belts or big heavy ones that carry, tons and tons of equipment um is there any more um 
musical projects that we don't know about? Any more recordings out there? Any other secret bands or side projects that you've done over the years besides the two that I named? Or is there any maybe coming up in the future? Gosh, I don't know. Uh, there might be... I think I did some acapella stuff from Frank Wildhorn's musical, The Civil War. So if you look that up in my name on YouTube, you might find me just sitting in my living room singing it. I posted it just for kicks because uh, I uh, there's a, a big um, – the entertainment industry is very happening in Toronto. And, and for a while, I was working as a personal trainer for Good Life Gyms. And one of the gals who worked there at the front desk was involved in the entertainment industry. And she just heard me humming and singing to myself. And she was like, what are you doing? Why are you hiding this gift from the world? And I was like, well, I spent 10 years not doing that. But <laughs> but um, she said, you got to get on this. And I was like, well, OK. So I recorded these silly demos of me sitting in my living room singing these kind of classical musical pieces. And it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, my Instagram, I'm singing on my Instagram in a couple places. But that's probably all you're going to find uh, is that uh, as far as any other future projects um i i was recently asked about this on another podcast so i'll say the same thing i said to him i i don't know i i don't um have any plans on it i'm not pursuing it but if something presented itself i wouldn't turn it down necessarily if i could work it into my schedule i'd probably be involved in so far as i could it's my biggest priorities are my my wife and my home and and this ridiculous dog i have sleeping next to me on the floor here that's those are my priorities but if i can stretch the old singing legs and do a little bit more of that i would i would love to do that it's always going to be a part of who i am right that's what's up man if you have the means bro i'd love to get you on a song or something man i do hip-hop as well so i'd love to get you on a song or something that'd be dope sure we'll figure it out yeah um I got some Harry Potter references. I, I might have sent you some stuff. I can't remember, but I got some Harry oh, Potter references. Oh, I don't references. know. I <laughs> have to go back and look. Stuff like that in my stuff. Like, uh, I, we, I did a song called um, Wingardium Leviosa um, talking about, you know what I'm saying, um, levitating, but doing it spiritually, like ascending mm -hmm. to new levels, you know, and I did it as like a like homage to my wife and daughter just because they loved it, but named That's it cool. that and just talking about going from one level to the next and just kind of tied it in there or whatever. So uh, it'd be awesome to do a song with you or something, man. Um, As far as uh, you said that you guys really wasn't influenced by um, Linkin Park, but you know what I'm saying? The similarities are there. The comparisons are there. What what were some of the bands or some of the music that influenced you? Because you were into hip hop, right? Some some aspect of it anyway. And then I guess rock or metal as well. But what were some of the influences for you coming up? Yeah, well, the, the hip hop influence was really more on um, on Nate and Jeff and those guys. I just kind of went along with it. Um, I was influenced by and large in terms of rock bands by... Um, it's funny you mentioned Andrew Schwab. Project 86 was a big influence on me. I love Project 86. Yeah. Um, Thursday. Yeah. Uh, the band Thursday. I really loved uh, their stuff quite a bit. Um, and that was mostly in the lyric writing is where I was influenced by them. Uh, the melodies were them somewhat. Um, the Juliana Theory had an influence mm -hmm. on us um, melodically. Um, and then my, you know, my background in musical theater, the works of Andrew Lloyd Webber were kind of always in my mind somewhere awesome man so was it what about any any heavy influences any of like corn or even Limp biscuit like we're talking about that kind of style or whatever yeah it's funny that you mentioned corn like corn was like all i listened to in high school i, yeah. I was a big corn fan so there was definitely some influence there um i think Limp biscuit had a little bit of influence on me as well um the deftones i love the deftones it's I, I say influence, but I want to use the word lightly because I never tried to copy yeah. necessarily what they were doing. But yeah. I'm sure whether I meant to or not, it kind of leaked through in places that those were bands that had uh, uh, connected with me. That's what's up, man. Um, so as far as like you, you're you're in, in in the faith and stuff now, are you still you currently attend church and stuff like that, or, uh, or is it just like a um, just a, a, a belief? Yeah, I'm looking for a church right now, uh, actually. And there's a couple that I'm, I'm going to check out just to find a place that's a good fit. Um, not because I have any problem with 
people who think different things about the faith that I do, but I want to go somewhere where I can be utilized with the gifts yeah. that I have. So I think that yeah. that's a, a biblical concept. And a, a lot of the places there's, you know, there's one that meets directly across the street from me, but I don't know that it would be a good fit because in their statement of faith, they're sort of required. It seems as to me to believe in recent universe creationism and you're required to believe in this particular understanding <laughs> of divine sovereignty. And I'm like, man, I can't sign up to that. Like, so I wouldn't be more power to you, nothing but love, but I just wouldn't be a good fit. So there's, but there's a couple around that I'm planning on, on attending that uh, I think would um, meet me where I'm at and allow me to, to be a part of. Yeah. It gets harder, the more studying you're doing, like the more reading right? and the more studying and referencing, like if, when you, when you were younger, you just showed up. Okay. I believe it. You know, whatever they told you to believe, you believed it until you start doing your own research and you say, well, this guy has some truths, but the other stuff I don't really like, but I like what, how he feels about this. And then this other guy who everybody, you know what I'm saying? Rejects. He's really good on this. And so, you know, in, in the end, that's kind of how the truth is. It's kind of like here a little, there a little, no one faith or doctrine or whatever usually has it all put together. And so when you go into those churches and stuff, you have to like what they say, uh, you know, eat the meat, spit out the bones type deal. And it, it, it becomes a lot harder, man, especially in yeah. ministry. And as you grow, if you study and stuff like that, man, you know, uh, do, do you, know the band thrice at all yeah 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 uh they they came out with a, a new record recently and i can't recall the name of the record but there's a song um lean into the gray okay uh, i looked sure that up that that's like my anthem <laughs> it's incredible an incredible piece i've been listening to black honey like crazy driving my wife crazy oh that's that a great song, song. amazing yeah yeah he did some worship stuff too right yeah yeah the, the lee singer did some worship stuff yeah, Dustin yeah. Kencher he's he's an incredible artist yeah um so was there any any stories we didn't talk about man any any funny stuff from the road um <laughs> you think make for a good podcast episode <laughs> man it, it was uh nothing but funny stuff on the road most of the time there's um what about, there dealing one... with church? What about okay go ahead I got another one for you after this go ahead all right no, it's just a short anecdote because it was just so silly. I We were um, doing a, a tour called the – oh, boy, I can't remember what the name of the tour was, but it was a long tour, and it ended in Florida somewhere. And I there was just not – they put all five of us in one hotel room, and I just wasn't – wasn't going to work for me. So we had this miniature bus at the time with a nice fold-out couch and a generator in there and great air conditioning. So I went down to sleep in the bus. Drummer didn't know that. So I'm down there sleeping in the bus. He's out – carousing with whoever from one of the other bands and he gets back and he just throws the door open with reckless abandon. This scares the hell out of me. So I scream like a little girl very, very loudly. And he does a backflip over the front seat into the front cabin. I thought it was hilarious. Maybe it's not as funny when you actually say it out loud, but <laughs> when it happened, I thought it was great. <laughs> That's hilarious. Any, any any chance you get to scare somebody, even accidentally? I guess both of y'all got scared, though, right? So you scared. Oh yeah, it, the, the mutual terror was what what did it. All right, what about because this this can be interesting, you know, doing Christian rock, you know, and you're traveling, probably playing a lot of churches back in the day, right? There's a lot of churches or whatever. This was a Presbyterian church that I seen you guys at. Um, not everybody is keen on Christian rock or Christian rap or whatever. So would you have any weird stories of dealing with weird church people who you play the first note, they grab all the kids and make them leave. Like I've been to shows like that where we rap and or play in the metal i had a rap metal band too and we hit the first note and they grabbed seven kids and just the parents walk them out you know that you know what i'm saying you were traveling doing that was there any of those ex experiences with weird church people or you know trying to get into weird philosophical debates or oh, yeah. anything like that oh yeah <laughs> probably a bunch right <laughs> i've got uh, yeah that, 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 that um I, let me preface any comment I'd have on that by saying, I think these people all meant very well. Exactly. They were concerned for, they, it might've been misplaced and they should have reconsidered how they approached it, I would say, but I, I don't want to vilify them or make them look stupid or anything like that. But yeah, there were some odd experiences. There was a guy who showed up once with his whole youth group. And the minute we started playing, he declared that we were the sounds of the evil one and 
took all the kids and made them leave. And I, you know, okay. Um, the, the poor promoter apologized to us for it. And I just said, don't worry about it. Like it's bound to happen every now and again, you know, and I had a stock response to that. People would ask us in interviews all the time, how do you respond to being a rock band and Christians? Isn't that, you know, evil music? And I just would say, how can music be evil? It's a sound that has no moral properties. And that always left them going, Whoa. Um, so that was one, there was one we did. We, we, we did a couple of, uh, of Pentecostal, type churches, um, which is a lot of fun, incredible, warm hearted people. And they love to pray for us before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lo- use them, Lord, anoint them, Lord. Yeah. yeah anoint- there was one lady who was doing that with that, with that, with that language, which is yeah. great. That's fine. That didn't bother me so much. It was that she had to go from band member to band member and put her hand really hard on her shoulder. And she was shaking you like this. Yeah. And she started to cackle while she did it. She was, it wasn't just a laugh. It was like a cackle. And that, that one was uncomfortable a little bit. She didn't use oil. No, thank oil, God. There was no oil poured on my head. head. Yeah. That, that would have been, I probably would have that. No, um, it would have messed up my hair. It's a show, man. Um, and then uh, there, <laughs> there was one we went to where it started with that kind of thing. And evolved into the kind of praying in tongues, I guess, um, that then in turn evolved into just screaming. Literally just, ah, just screaming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, they've got their eyes closed and their hands on us, and they're just yelling, nothing, not even words. And we open our eyes and look at each other, and we start laughing. Because you can't. It, it's so unbelievably uncomfortable. You're like, what is this? Mm-hmm. So that that was probably the most interesting um, laying of hands and pray for us before a show that I, I, I ever happened in the world. <laughs> it was very odd. Yeah, man. I've, I've got thousands of stories like that as well, man. Of um, going to little small churches in the, in the middle of nowhere in, in the country and in the ghetto or whatever. And just all these different belief systems in a way that they operate and how they even churches where they venerate the pastor as like a king in weird places. Like I've been to those churches too. Oh, wow, really? You know where they sit on like these these thrones and stuff like that. Like on the on the stage and the platform is like way higher than everybody, like above your head, and you got to go up there. And that, I went to this one where the pastor came. He the pastor would come in late on purpose, so uh, somebody's um, reading the uh, the uh, church announcements. And he's standing up reading them. And then a pastor comes in through the side door late and he's got a purple robe on and rings and stuff. And then uh, he said, all rise for the pastor. You know, the man of God is here. And it made everybody stand up. And the pastor comes in. He's looking at the audience, looking in. He goes up on the stage and he he's, he g- gets in front of this big old, pretty much a throne, just like on TBN how, back in the day where they had those big golden <laughs> thrones and chalices. They literally had that stuff up there. And uh, before he sits down, he looks at the crowd and kind of waves his hands down like a uh, like a king would do. You know, like, okay, it's time to, you guys can sit down now and let everybody s- be seated. Then he kind of, you know, gives the motion for the guy to continue with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, serm- or the, uh, announcements or whatever yeah really yeah. weird and then i've seen like guys outside the pastor's office while he was praying and reading the bible and they got guns they're like guards one on each side of the door armed guards that's the man of god he got the anointing on his life and people look people want to kill the man of god and they're like this is bodyguard his church has like 17 people in the church but just you know this is really weird weird stuff out there that the, that's Mind blowing! <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, it's just just churchianity, man. In and of itself, there's just so much, mm. you know, weird stuff out there that you find and all that kind of stuff, man. Um, as far as you know, you talking about speaking in tongues and 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 the oil and all that kind of stuff and playing at some Pentecostal churches. Do you do you get into the more spiritual side of the faith or faith or is it more practical? Is it more you know what I'm saying theological of the Baptist or Reformed theology? Is there something that you kind of you you kind of lean towards, or do you mess with any of the the you know the word of faith or praying for healing and those type of aspects of the faith? Yeah. Well, to answer the question directly, um, my theological leanings are 
would probably look closer to to the Anglicanism, to the Church of England, um, which is a kind of um, basically Catholic, except you can get married. Um, so I, and that's a position I've come to over a lot of years of uh, just study, really wanting to understand the New Testament, understand this as history, because Jesus of Nazareth was an historical person who lived and breathed in the first century during the second temple period. And that means that he had a particular set of ideas in his mind that he was working with. Um, he was not a, a, some freakish character who was completely outside the realm of his world. He couldn't be. He would have made no sense and had no impact. So he was someone who was speaking to a world, living and breathing in a world, in a context. And I want to know what that means for him, because I can't understand what Jesus is talking about if I don't understand what Jesus is talking about. What, what world of ideas were his world of ideas? What did what he say mean to the people at the time? Um, and then that therefore informs the way the rest of the New Testament works. And sort of where that's led me is this kind of Anglican-ish, um, I guess you would say more practical approach. So now then with respect to questions about healing and the more esoteric aspects of the faith, I, I just, I'm very open to it. I don't know. It's, it's not a thing that I have done a lot of homework in, mm -hmm. in terms of spiritual experience. You know, I can say for myself, um, I, I typically experience the kind of sense of the divine that I think is common to all Christians, what the reformers called the sensus definitatus. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, when I was with those, those kids at Iowa State University who were from Davenport, Iowa, there was a very palpable sense of God's presence there. Yeah. Um, and a couple other times in my life, but for the most part, you know, no, I, I don't, um, I haven't had seen a lot of healings or, or anything like that. I'm not saying they don't happen. In fact, I know, uh, I can think of one scholar off the top of my head who did a great deal of research about miracle. I think Craig Keener is his name. Um, very academic, well-respected New Testament scholar. And, and his conclusion was, yes, these things do still happen. Um, and he's documented it. Now I haven't read the book, so I can't, critique it or anything but that's just my way of saying i'm open to it there is good evidence for it i'm i'm just on the fence i don't know enough because it's not where i've spent my time doing the homework right so i don't want to say I, i'm real sure about this that or the other thing when i i'm really not so i i want to be careful about how i approach that yeah for sure man um so with spiritual encounters or whatever have you uh what about like uh paranormal encounters whether it's ufos or ghosts or any uh psychics or anything like that have you had any encounters with that at all you know what's funny it's funny you asked me that um as i say i've got this dog and so <laughs> he sees other, things <laughs> yeah well maybe i don't know about that but um <laughs> I, I think he's just weird barks at walls he's not whatever um but uh the day after i got him i went to get my hair cut and there's a lady who always oh, very friendly. And I've had, she's cut my hair a bunch of times, never anything out of the ordinary. And she looks at me and she goes, you have a new baby at home. And I looked at her and I was like, well, not exactly, but I have a puppy. How did you, it, it was, it wasn't that she said exactly what I had at home, but it was that she just clearly intuited this thing you know, which was this new puppy. And I thought that that was interesting. Um, but that's really the only sort of experience like that that I've had. I guess I can think of a couple others if you're interested that aren't psychic, but they're just kind of in intriguing spiritual yeah. Yeah, sure, things. Man. Um, my mom has always been um, a, a prayer warrior for me. Um, and I, I remember a during a period, not the same as the Ministry of Magic times, but way before that, I was dealing with just some deep doubts about the truth of the faith. And I was having this dream that I was at my house uh, and this darkness entity had just seized my mind. And I lost all control and sort of floated like a feather down the staircase to what was my, my parents' bedroom. And the door was open and my mother was there on the ground kneeling, praying for me. And then I woke up with a start. It was three o'clock in the morning. And I told her about that. And she said, how very interesting, because she had woken up at three o'clock in the morning with something, as people say, something telling her, uh, I need to pray for my son. Mm -hmm. So th that's one example, I guess, of a kind of, there's a few like that throughout my life that are not definitive anything, but just interesting 
phenomena that are hard to dismiss. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, man. Um, almost like a synchronicity or whatever the case is and having those things happen that kind of hard to explain both of you guys going through something in, in the wee hours of the mo- morning. I remember uh, I had a uh, the, the um, one of the guys who discipled me after I came to the Lord. Um, he talked about waking up in, at three in the morning with something pinning him down to the bed, like a, a spirit or a demon or whatever the case is, you know? And, um, then he said the same night, um, whatever it was, went into the room with his dad and his dad had like the same type of encounter the same night. So it was like two mm. people in the same house, having it, having it happen in, in the same night. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> talking about those weird church experiences, man. And it kind of, uh, with the Christian rock thing, I got a, I got a, um, my brother-in-law, who's uh, uh, a you know a, a fan of Third Eighth Parallel, would say he's still a fan of like you know what I'm saying classic. Uh, I would I mean, we wouldn't call it classic, but <laughs> classic. N- n- nostalgic. <laughs> Let's just say nostalgic. Right? Classic. <laughs> all right. I got gray hair. I'm gonna be forty in like a year and a half. I know, it right? Is so we're trying to find out how to <laughs> refer back to this stuff. But like I said, man, that stuff still holds up, man. That that I'm I'm still putting people on that stuff now because like as far as like stylistically it's coming back like now papa roach is doing that now papa roach is rapping again right and i noticed these, that yeah all these other bands are coming out sounding more like pod or sounding more like old school rage against the machines and, and it's coming out on the radio i've heard i heard something the other day uh um some there's a band something 333 is in their in their name but uh they uh they're they sound like rage against the machine and they're rapping and stuff on <laughs> on the radio so um huh. It's coming back though, but my um, brother-in-law he went to a little backwoods revival with a with a friend of of his, and um, he was wearing a Demon Hunter shirt, and so Demon Hunter was big back in the day, you know, and so their logo is a uh, a demon skull. It looks like a cow skull, but it's a demon with these big horns with a bullet hole in its forehead. So he had the uh, the Demon Hunter shirt. He went to the revival, and the pastor asked him to, uh, you know you know where where does he get the nerve to wear that shirt in their church and uh he said well this is a christian band and no 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 somebody lied to you young man that is not a christian band that's that's not of god that's a, a, a demonic shirt and you're not supposed to wear it in this in a house of god you know that quote-unquote house of god being a building mm-hmm. or something you know and they they kind of they pointed him out of the crowd in the middle of the sermon or whatever and uh they actually made him him take his shirt off in the church little backwoods hole in the wall church took his shirt off and they prayed they prayed for him they laid hands on him and put anointing oil on him they held him down and they were like pouring anointing oil in his mouth saying that he had demons and stuff because he wore that church that shirt to church that's these weird little backwards hey, yeah see experience. now at that level i i almost want to ask did he file charges because no, that right. is assault uh Honestly, that, that's know, a form of a assault. Weird. So that that would be one. Okay, I got a comment on this. <laughs> that's too wild. For one thing, depictions of demons in the house of God. Um, I like what you said about the house of God is not a building. It's yeah. the people. The church means that. Ecclesia, the people, the called out ones. Um, but let's let's talk about the, the meeting places. Have they never been to what was all of the churches in Europe up until recently where there was paintings, religious paintings Gold that have demons in the paintings. So that's just patently false. What he said, it's just historically, whether he likes it or not, doesn't matter as a matter of art history. He's just wrong about that for one, for two, very devaluing to talk to someone like that and not listen to their perspective, just decide what it is. And <laughs> certainly devaluing to hold them down and pour oil down their throat. That's assault. So this is why there is, the whole world looks at Christians and instead of saying, I know them by their love, they know them by their crazy. And that needs yeah. to just stop. We need to be honest about the fact that we're wretches who need grace too. I for sure am for one, and then try to live like people who've been redeemed by that grace. On the other hand, certainly not make stupid mistakes about art history and pour oil down someone's throat. When you separate yourself for so long, 
you start making up these new ideas and these new rules and these new things that you start adding to the scriptures. You start adding to uh, doctrine or whatever the case is, stuff that's not even biblical by any means. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's what the Pharisees did, mm-hmm. right? That's that's exactly. Phariseeism in the first century. If you read Josephus, that's precisely what they did. That's what Jesus is reacting to when he speaks to them all through the New Testament. Yep, because they're just adding all these laws and they're their laws and traditions they're honoring it over the scriptures you know or the laws of moses even for them who who supposedly keep the law of moses but they have all these new things that they uh hold over that it's really interesting and it's still happening man and i tell people all the time they ask me you know about that sect of pharisees and stuff but i think spiritually we could become pharisees to other people if we're not careful man you know we receive that because jesus always dealt with the spirit of it too because moses dealt with the that spirit and now you know his fathers and everybody now jesus is dealing with the same type of people or or that spirit in the earth you know yeah 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 really interesting well brother i appreciate you coming on the podcast man i enjoyed this conversation man rehashing some old pictures (laughs) and some old memories (laughs) and uh, i got a lot more where this came from man so it's good stuff, dude. I'm sure that's some awesome, awesome memories for you. And, and you know what I'm saying? Like I said, again, dude, it'd be awesome to hear uh, you do something in, in the future. Even if it's not a band, man, find a way to kind of do your own thing, which is what I've done. You know what I'm saying? I like the whole I like the yeah. whole band thing myself. But, uh, you know, it's hard keeping five guys on the same page and, you know, family oh, yeah. and marriages and practices two three times a week and sometimes it's hard but maybe maybe even do some of your own solo stuff man because you're good at rapping you say you just got into it because everybody else was doing it but you're actually really good at it man so uh that album is good dude turn the tides like i said we, we have our own uh um private discord where we hang out with the community here and i I play your music in there all the time and uh turn people on to it so yeah good well, stuff, awesome. man. thanks again brother uh anything you want to plug you. man promote you got anything going on you know, no, I guess I would just close by quoting the great Bill and Ted. Be excellent to each other and party on. Party on, man. Well, hey, bro, I really enjoyed it, man, and we'll have to do it again. Thanks so much. Sounds like a plan. You take care, man. All right. God bless. Say be you. Mark Jennings. 38th parallel. Yo. Uh-oh. Sorry. I'm clicking the wrong stuff. I don't even know what I'm supposed to click. Yo. Oh, Yo. Oh, Look at that. I'm trying to run up. A- a live show i'm playing the intro or outro um yeah good stuff I, I really enjoyed that conversation and uh it's all about nostalgia here man there's something about nostalgia like i said i had um uh these five down on um two weeks ago and uh had him on and they were they were out around the same time 2002 where's the time went this is a we still have the ticket stub skillet before skillet was skillet that you know today uh we used to travel we used to drive hours we drove four hours to go to this concert and i was a, i was a diehard fan of those guys so it was really cool all this time later i'm gonna have my own radio show and get a chance to interview um my favorite bands you know that's so cool i love it created um the ministry of magic um really interesting stuff too like i said my family are like diehard Harry Potter fans, um, and uh, those those videos they've done, they've done like um, well, I don't know if you call it nightcore songs, but they're like really fun poppy type songs. And so the Ministry of Magic, and so they got like uh, millions of views on his other project that they did. That was really interesting too. So it's good stuff. So yeah, I'm give a shout out to everybody hanging out in the chat on this surprise Saturday podcast. Um, Santiago says it's funny how life works that way. Yeah, time is something, man. Time is something, you know. Moving forward and just creating the life that you want for yourself and you want to do it, you make it happen, you bring it to the table and that's how it works. And so um yeah, I don't really have much to talk about except tomorrow I'm excited for uh you know, the first um seer session that we're doing. So, I'm going to be leading that session and we're going to be doing holotropic breathing breath work i got some techniques that i'm gonna show you guys and we're gonna do it together and uh it'll be something where we we can actually tap in together and be be more focus driven as far as that is concerned and uh i'm going to be leading that so if you want to um be a part of that 
um, Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. Central. It's $12 per week, and uh, you can um, get access to that via Patreon, and it's going to be good. I'm looking forward to it. And I got some more stuff that we're bringing to the table, a whole bunch of stuff that I'm working on. So, again, thank you guys for the support. Um, any level, whatever you're doing, if you're, you know, what I'm saying donating on Patreon, if you're sharing my work, if you're listening, if you're telling people about my music and my podcast, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I appreciate everyone, all of our community. And I know people aren't able to give financially. Other people give in other ways. So thank you guys for everything that you're doing. It means the world to me. And, uh, we're going to keep on keeping on. Still got a whole bunch of more shows booked in the next month or so. I think I'm about a month, uh, booked in. But we got some interesting guests lined up, and uh, it's going to be really good. So with that, I'm going to say peace and shalom, and uh, I'll hang out with you guys in Discord. Meet me over there. That's what we do. If you're not a, if you're not in our Discord, that link is in the description. So hang out with us. Peace, peace. That does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.